Good morning and welcome to the 2020 Focus on Research Seminar Series. My name is Enrica Ziller, Outreach and Events Manager in the Office of Research at the University of Texas at Dallas. I will be your moderator. As we move through today's session, I invite you to post questions into the Q&A box for our guest speaker to answer. Joining me today is Tarjani Shukla, a PhD candidate in molecular and cell biology at the University of Texas at Dallas. Tarjani, welcome. Thank you so much for uh, having me on. I'm super excited to be presenting some of my work that I've been doing in Dr. Campbell's lab over the past year and a half. Um, so the premise of my talk is uh, trying to identify and characterize a potential a pharmacological therapeutic to be used uh, as a potential therapy in the context of fragile X syndrome. So uh, most of this work, all, all of this work was done in Dr. Campbell's lab with help from our collaborators. Um, and yeah, I'm super excited to get started. So what is fragile X syndrome? Fragile X syndrome is an X-linked disorder. It's the single leading monogenic cause of autism spectrum disorder and it affects more males than females because it is X-linked. Patients with Fragile X syndrome typically present with intellectual disability, developmental delays, deficits in learning and memory, as well as deficits in social interactive behaviors. Uh, so currently there is no FDA approved therapeutic um, to be used as a therapy in the context of Fragile X syndrome. So a large portion of the work that I've done in Dr. Campbell's lab is to identify um, possible therapies to be used in this context. Okay, so we know a little bit about Fragile X syndrome, but what really causes it? So Fragile X syndrome is uh, typically caused by a trinucleotide CGG expansion in the FMR1 gene. Uh, so the CGG expansion renders the FMR1 gene silent and no fragile X mental retardation protein is produced, or FMRP. So what does FMRP do? Uh, FMRP uh, associates with the ribosome or the polysome and has also been shown to bind to the mRNA and its specific targets. Uh, it's found all over the body, but is mostly concentrated in the brain and testes. Um, and in the brain, it's typically found in uh, the cell body and dendrites of neurons. So there have been around 900 mRNA targets that have been identified for FMRP. Um, most of those are associated with learning and memory or synaptic plasticity events. Uh, typically though, as you can see in this figure, FMRP is thought of as a translational break or repressor. So you can see in the top half of this uh, figure that when there's no FMRP present, we get active translation of our mRNA transcript. However, when FMRP is present, as denoted by the red circle, it binds to the polysome and represses mRNA translation. So the current model stipulates that in fragile X syndrome, we get silencing of the FMR1 gene, which leads to loss of FMRP, which leads to a significant uh, or aberrant protein translation. That aberrant protein translation, uh, other groups have characterized to also be um, contiguous or synonymous with increased EIF4E phosphorylation. So remember that EIF4E is a translation initiation factor. Um, and once it's phosphorylated, it can bind to the cap of the mRNAs to initiate uh, translation initiation. Uh, so in particular, uh, Sonnenberg's group, as well as Bob Darnell's group and Eric Klan's group have all characterized the role of FMRP in translation through a variety of different pulse chase um, assays and tests. Um, and what they've found is that loss of FMRP leads to an increase in nascent protein synthesis um, and protein translation, as well as an increase in EIF-40 phosphorylation. So the most of the work that I've done or all of the work that I've done um, that I'll be talking about today was done in a mouse model of fragile X syndrome, which is just a whole body knockout of the FMR1 gene. Uh, 
So our general hypothesis is that we can compensate for this loss of fMRP in the fragile X mice through manipulation of translation of initiation, specifically through MINK inhibition. If we inhibit MINK from phosphorylating 4E, we should see that level of translational homeostasis restored. So to talk a little bit about what tool we'll be using to regulate aberrant protein translation, uh, we used primarily a tool called EFT508 or Effector. It's a small molecule inhibitor of MINK. Um, and again, it prevents MINK from phosphorylating EIF4E. Uh, so Effector is actually in late stage two clinical trials right now um, as a potential cancer therapy. Uh, and in murine models has been shown to prevent tumor formation as well as prevent peripheral injury induced neuropathy and chemotherapy induced neuropathy. Uh, all of the contexts in which Effector has been used um, all work in the periphery. So something that we tried to characterize through this study is the role of EFT508 in the context of the central nervous system. And we approach this problem in th three separate ways. The first of which is to identify and understand the role of EFT508 on 4E phosphorylation in the brain. So if we give it systemically, it doesn't even cross the blood-brain barrier and have the effect molecularly that we want to observe. Second is behaviorally after EFT508 treatment, do we see an effect on the mice, um, particularly in the fragile X background? And then lastly, we wanted to understand how manipulation of translation initiation would affect development and synaptic plasticity at the level of individual neurons and synaptic circuits through imaging and electrophysiology. So most of the data that I'll be talking about today fall under these three categories um, and conclusions. Um, and I'm excited to talk a little bit about some of the data that we've collected. Uh, so the first thing we wanted to um, identify is, does EFT508 cross the blood-brain barrier? Um, we want it to get to regions of the brain that are important for mediating the deficits in Fragile X syndrome. So a key region associated with those deficits is the hippocampus, which is primarily thought to be the center of learning and memory synthesis in the brain. So after a systemic injection of effector at varying doses, we probed for um, EIF4E phosphorylate EIF4E phosphorylation via Western blot, and we can see that there's a clear dose-dependent and significant effect after a single treatment of our potential therapy, which serves to be promising in this context. This is uh, just another way of showing those same data, where um, in the top three figures, you can see uh, the hippocampus uh, and the effect of, and the levels of EIF4E phosphorylation in these images um, as denoted in the purple panels. And the green panels are uh, just denoted by, they stain, we stain for like a pan neuronal marker. Um, so those green dots you see are just uh, the neurons in the hippocampus. And after a single treatment with effector, we see that EIF4E phosphorylation is significantly decreased particularly in neurons in the hippocampus, as shown by the signal localization between our neuronal marker and our phospho-EIF4E antibody. And these are just some quantification um, to indicate the data from the previous slide. So our first conclusion uh, is that effector crosses the blood-brain barrier and decreases 4E phosphorylation. Great. But what does that really have to do with the core behaviors and deficits associated with fragile X syndrome. So here I just have a table outlining the core behaviors that we tested in the mice and how they can be interpreted um, and relayed back uh, to the human model or system. So just as an example, um, I'll take the open field and fecal boli assays. Those are two tests that we run the mice through, um, which indicate hyperactivity and anxiety-like behaviors in the mice which direct, we can directly correlate as um, human behaviors of hyperactivity and anxiety. And again, for the rest of the assays, you can see the same correlative um, behaviors and effects. So uh, I just wanted to include this slide to indicate 
the number of times the mice were treated throughout the testing paradigm. So the mice were treated every single day of the behavioral um, pipeline. Uh, we tested the animals for four days. So they got four different injections of EFT 508 at the same dose. And then we ran the assay. So the first set of behaviors that we ran uh, were hyperactivity and anxiety-like behaviors. Uh, so to quickly explain, uh, before I explain uh, the data, the open field assay um, essentially is where we place the mice in a white box and we let them explore the area freely for 30 minutes. We record their behavior uh, through a video camera and then run that recording through an electronic scoring software where it tracks the mouse and we can count total distance traveled by each mouse. Uh, so you can see in both the fecal boli and open field assay, we see an increase in fecal boli present in our FMR fragile X background, as well as an increase in total distance traveled in those knockout mice. So we interpret these, these data to mean two things. The first of which uh, indicates an increase in anxiety and anxiety-like behaviors. So an increase in fecal boli present in the arena at the end of testing indicate increased anxiety. And an increase in total distance traveled compared to wild type indicate hyperactivity. Uh, so it's important to remember that a single or singular behavioral assay is a little bit hard to interpret on its own. We can't really understand what's going on in the entire system or the entire mouse um, just by looking at one singular assay. So that's the reason we look at um, about a half dozen different behavioral tests. So it might seem uh, a little bit like a stretch to look at fecal boli and just count it as anxiety-like behaviors, but because we couple it with open field behavioral tests and object rec novel object recognition tests and other behavioral assays, we can come to a more holistic um, and informed conclusion about the mouse behavior. So after we treat with effector, this is after they've gotten a single dose of our specific therapeutic, we see a significant decrease in fecal boli present in the arena after testing, as well as a decrease in total distance traveled. So again, we can interpret these data to mean a decrease in hyperactive behaviors, as well as a decrease in anxiety-like behaviors in the mice. Uh, another behavioral assay that um, I'll explain is a marble burying test. Um, so this test is to measure obsessive and repetitive behaviors, but also to measure um, digging and burrowing behavior, which are also measures of anxiety-like behaviors on the mice. Um, so I'll just explain the pictures on the left a little bit. Um, you can see during the test, the mice are placed into a cage with 15 marbles, and they're again given 30 minutes to explore the area and engage in behaviors freely. We can see that the wild type mice, the marbles look disturbed, but they're not burrowed underneath the surface of the bedding. Versus in our knockout fragile X group, we see that most of the marbles are buried, um, which indicates engagement in obsessive and repetitive behaviors, as well as um, increased anxiety-like behaviors. Um, and then after treatment with EFT 508, we see that that deficit is also resolved as indicated by number of marbles buried. Um, a similar assay that we run is the nest building behavior. Um, I haven't included it, but if you'd like to um, discuss it further or later, we can talk about it then. Uh, so our second conclusion is that EFT 508 treatment resolves core behavioral deficits in fragile X syndrome, particularly hyperactive behaviors, anxiety-like behaviors, and obsessive and repetitive behaviors. But it key phenotype of Fragile X syndrome is also deficits in learning and memory. So we did a series of two behavioral tests, the first of which is called novel object recognition to test learning and memory. So again, to explain the assay a little bit, the mice are placed into the arena for training with two identical objects, and they're given 30 minutes to habituate to the area and the objects before they're removed. And placed back in their home cage for an hour while we replaced one of the identical objects with a novel object. And during the testing phase, we placed the mouse back into the arena and measure uh, total number of interactions and dwell time with either object. So there's a novel stimulus 
as indicated by the cube and a familiar stimulus. So you can see it. This is visualized uh, representatively through heat maps. Um, in our well tech group, our mice recognize the familiar object and are trying to familiarize themselves with the novel object or stimulus. They recognize that it's something new, so they want to explore it and learn more about it. Um, and that's indicated by a more intense red color, which indicates longer dwell time. However, in our Fragile X group, we see no preference between familiar or novel objects, which indicates uh, that maybe that memory or recognition between familiar or novel object wasn't synthesized um, efficiently. And then after treatment with EFT 508, by this day of the testing paradigm, they've gotten three treatments. We see that that deficit is resolved. And these are just some quantification. Again, we count total number of interactions and we see our well type group interacts more frequent, frequently with the novel object. Our KO FMR group shows no preference between the two. And then after treatment with effector, that deficit is resolved. So this is sort of same song, second verse, um, rather than the stimuli being inanimate objects uh, in the novel object, like in the novel object recognition test, uh, this is rather a social interaction um, assay. So the stimuli are live mice placed in cages. So our experimental mouse, or in this case, the purple mouse, is able to interact freely with either. And again, we can see by the heat maps and quantification that our wild type group prefer the novel male in this instance. Uh, our FMR group, uh, not only are they deficient in learning and memory, but they also have deficits in social behaviors. So they seem to show no preference, or in this specific instance, they seem to prefer the familiar male. And then after treatment with effector, we see that that deficit is resolved and they show preference for our novel stimulus, in this case, the novel male. So our third conclusion is that social memory and learning deficits are rescued after repeated treatment with EFT 508. Again, all of the doses were um, consistent, so they were all at a five mg per kg systemic dose. Uh, so I mentioned that the last uh, portion of the three key uh, questions that we wanted to approach was looking at uh, neuron plasticity and how transla inhibiting translation initiation might affect um, neurons at the individual de developmental level. So um, I'll start by explaining this image. Um, this is a picture of a a pyramidal hippocampal neuron, um, and this is d after Golgi cock staining. So um, we cleared the tissue and we're able to see the cell body and the dendrites clearly. Um, so as denoted by the red uh, arrow, that triangle in the middle of the picture uh, denotes the cell body of the neuron. And then those long string-like projections that are projecting off of that uh, cell body are the dendrites. So dendrites receive input from other neurons and neighboring cells and are extremely dynamic. So they respond to different um, stimuli uh, on the order of hours and days and they're extremely plastic. Uh, and so they have an extremely high turnover rate because they're able to get this information and then relay it on um, to pass on the message in the circuit. Uh, so you can see off of the dendrites there are smaller finger-like projections, and those are called dendritic spines. And so those are the centers for synthesis and it, like receiving inputs uh, from neighboring cells. And those dendritic spines also have an ex extremely high turnover rate, particularly in development. So it's important to understand that in fragile X syndrome is particularly uh, most commonly known as a neurodevelopmental disorder. So these dendrites and dendritic spines have an extremely high turnover rate um, during development, and that is impaired in Fragile X syndrome. So we can see, I'll talk about the pictures uh, first. So in the wild type group, these mice have mature, um, mature, dendritic spines and synaptic connections. 
which are indicated by short mushroom-like and stubby spines versus our fragile XKO groups. They have a lot more spines, a lot more of them. And the spines that they do have are thin and finger-like, which indicate immature uh, synaptic uh, events and immature dendritic spines. Uh, so we counted the number of spines, uh, total density of the spines per 10 microns, and we see an increase in total number of spines in our fragile XKO group. Um, and then after repeated treatment with EFT 508, we see that that deficit is also resolved. And we can sort of corroborate these data with the data that we saw previously um, looking at the behavioral changes and molecular changes that we observe uh, in the brains of these mice. Um, so as the synaptic connections are being strengthened and as the neurons are developing and becoming more mature after EFT 508 treatment, we see uh, the cognitive and physiologic deficits are also resolved in this uh, background. So our, our last conclusion for this talk uh, is that effector resolves abnormal neuronal plasticity and maturation um, in addition to all of the other deficits that we see resolved after EFT 508 treatment. Uh, there are a couple of conclusions uh, that I wanted to talk about and what the implications of this research really mean, um, particularly uh, that EFT 508 can serve as a potential therapy to be used in the context of Fragile X syndrome. So like I mentioned earlier, there are no current FDA approved therapeutics uh, that could be used uh, for patients who have this disorder. Um, but because it's so close, um, it's already in late phase two clinical trials and it's shown to be well tolerated in humans. Um, this would serve as a nice alternative um, to repurpose this specific therapy in the context of those in this disorder as well. Uh, I think a lot of this work, because it was done in a mouse model, further testing would definitely be required in a more human-like system. So looking particularly at electrophysiological activity in human patient-derived iPSCs um, and observing the effects of EFT 508 on uh, synaptic firing and uh, looking at how the neurons respond um, after treatment with this specific inhibitor. But I think also this serves as a nice jumping off point for studying potential mechanisms that are responsible for um, driving disease pathology in Fragile X syndrome. So I think this study helps build the foundation for understanding that dysregulation of protein translation, particularly translation initiation, is responsible for driving at least some of the pathology associated with Fragile X syndrome. And um, not only are we able to characterize a new potential therapy, but we're able to get a little bit one step closer to um, identifying why uh, this trinucleotide CDG expansion, the FMR1 gene, leads to such significant um, cognitive deficits in patients with this disorder. So with that, I'd like to just acknowledge um, some of the people that have helped me uh, complete this project along the way, particularly uh, Brian and Dr. Campbell from the, the Campbell Lab. Um, we worked on designing the experiments and then um, Brian and I did a majority of the behavioral experiments together. But also I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Plosky and Dr. Thorne and John, our collaborators um, in the neuroscience department for helping with uh, immunohistochemistry and electrophysiology, and also our collaborators at Effector, Craig and Kevin, for um, assisting with, again, experiment, experimental design and um, providing us with EFT 508. So with that, I'd like to thank everyone for listening to my talk. Um, and if anyone has any questions, I'd love to take them now. Thank you, Tarjani. Yes, we do have several questions, but plenty of room for more. So if anyone has some, go ahead and start typing.
Um, the first one that I have for you is what are some examples of anxiety behaviors in mice? And I heard you mention a few, so just quickly go over them again. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, it's hard to ask a mouse if it's feeling anxious or not. So we can characterize it in a couple different ways. Um, primarily in the field, a lot of people observe uh, digging and burrowing behaviors as measures of anxiety. Um, but uh, another measure of anxiety behaviors is again the fecal boli assay, which we've included, uh, which I talked about in one of the first slides, where an increase in fecal boli in the field can be interpreted as increased anxiety um, in this specific context. Uh, so again, one behavioral assay on its own doesn't really tell us much, but because we look at so many different measures of anxiety as well as other measures of learning behaviors, it helps paint a clearer picture about what's really going on and the effect that EFT 508 might have in this background. Excellent. The next question we have, um, since the heat maps show that the mice go to both the familiar object and the new one, does that mean anxiety can be triggered by past events as well as not knowing the future? Or is it caused by a memory issue? That's a good question. Um, and I think it's difficult to interpret and tease out if it's one or the other. I think because we're looking at mouse behavior, it's kind of difficult to really nail down which is the difference between either. Um, but I think in this specific instance, because we're looking at both the novel object assay and the social interaction assay, wherein the novel object is completely inanimate um, in the first assay, the novel object test, um, we don't we can't interpret that to mean social behavioral anxiety simply because it's between an animate versus inanimate object. So I understand the question, and I guess the short answer is we can't really know, but uh, we can tease out the mechanism by trying other behavioral tests. So one thing that I didn't mention is that the social interaction assay is done in three phases. The first of which is a social approach test, which is testing preference for a novel stimulus versus a familiar stimulus, but the familiar object is inanimate and the novel object is a live mouse. So again, we can measure social behaviors and we see the same trend where our well type group prefers the novel stimulus, our fragile X mice show deficits in learning and memory because they prefer the familiar object, but it could also be a combination of deficits in memory, but also uh, deficits in social behaviors, which could be why they prefer the familiar object. Um, and then after treatment with effector, we see that that deficit is resolved. It's a good question. Thank I hope you. That yes, yes. The next question, have you tried looking at animate versus inanimate interaction? It would be interesting to see if they show preference to the inanimate object versus live animal and what's resolved with your treatment. Yeah, so I guess I kind of explained that um, in the previous question, but we see the same trend where our fragile X mice seem to prefer the inanimate object um, and then that deficit is resolved after treatment with EFT 508. Um, so that assay is called social approach. Um, for the sake of clarity, I just included one of the social interactive behaviors, but um, the trend is the same. Dr. Campbell would like to know precisely what do you think of the EIF4E phosphorylation does to the EIF4E activity function. And nice work. That's a, oh, thanks. Um, that's a good question. I don't think we really know uh, is the short answer. Um, so groups have identified the role of EIF4E phosphorylation in initiating CAP dependent translation, but there's a lot of contention about its real function. And I think 
the role of phospho EIF4E not only in cap dependent translation initiation, but also in this specific background is still a little bit unclear. Um, I guess the best way that I can think of to uh, sort of prove that phospho EIF4E is important in this context is um, the Holmes Tonnenberg's group actually did a series of experiments where they cross these fragile X mice with uh, a non phosphorylatable version of EIF4E, and we see that those deficits are resolved. Um, so the genetic approach makes it clear that there must be some significant role that EIF4E phosphorylation is playing in this background, but I don't think that we really know why it's important or what it's really doing. All right, more research, more research to go. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Good news. I don't see any more questions from the audience. Um, I am curious though, you mentioned autism at the very beginning mm -hmm. of the presentation. Can you circle back and again explain probably um, how all of this correlates to that? Sure, uh, that's a good question. So fragile X syndrome, patients that have fragile X syndrome can fall under the umbrella of autism spectrum disorder. So a lot of research has been done um, trying to understand the core phenotypes of fragile X syndrome and how they fit within the autism spectrum. Um, and we see that there is a significant majority of patients with fragile X syndrome that fall on the spectrum. Uh, so because of the phenotypes and deficits that they have. Uh, but the FMR1 knockout mice are not the only model of autism spectrum disorder that we could study. So something that we are pursuing and would I would like to pursue is looking at the role of this specific therapeutic in the context of other um, genetic models of autism spectrum disorder or general models of ASD in mice. Um, I think it would help the case of like using this specific therapy in not only fragile X syndrome, but other um, models of ASD, if we can see the positive effect that it's having in other um, genetic models. Yeah, does that make sense? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes, thank you. That's, there's a lot of potential there. That's very <laughs> exciting. Um, okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing your talent, time, and resources with us, Tarjani. Thank you for having me. <laughs> um, thank everyone in the audience for attending today. And if you like this seminar, then perhaps you might check out the next Lab to Launch webinar coming this Monday, June 29th, featuring Dr. Katie Rodinko, CEO, Max IR Labs, discussing from lab to field, a discussion on customer development. Please see the announcement in the Q&A section for the link to view the complete seminar schedule and to register. Thanks again for joining us and have a great afternoon, everyone.